Welcome everybody to our third video from the collaboration between Protocol Labs and uh, my brand Scientific Writing Vault. My name is Emma Silva and today we're going to be uh, looking at some important concepts and um, let's say even knowledge that you need to have in order to choose the correct type of scientific publication. Most of us researchers, no matter what um, the type of research that we do, uh, we are very, very much pushed for the traditional scientific paper that gets published either in conference proceedings or journals. But today we're going to look at the, all the different options, what are their characteristics and what should be our approach also to choose the correct one depending on our intention and on our type of research. The second main aspect of today's video is related to on the formats for publishing. So there's two main types for publishing and we're gonna be covering those today. They're really very important because they can have very influential impacts on your career, on your visibility and on promoting your, your research outputs to different target audiences and uh, of course, to, to other different players that might be involved in terms of collaboration. So bear with me, come on board and let's go and have a look. So we're gonna be covering what are the main communication tools, what is the value of publishing and conferences, the types of publication and then the types of publishing. In terms of communication tools, posters or in other words, going to conferences either with posters or publishing in the conference proceedings or uh, also giving an oral presentation. All of these three, three main process or these three main tools are extremely useful to have in your CV. They all of them play a different role and they come out of different needs and the motivations to choose which one um, are, are quite different. So most of us are pushed and it makes a lot of sense to go to conferences with presentations, with commu oral communications, not only 15 minute slots to describe uh, our research. There's also uh, normally when you get accepted with a communication, you're invited to submit an abstract and if that abstract is accepted, then you might be invited to publish an extended abstract or even a mini paper uh, in the conference proceedings. It works a little bit or it's analogous to uh, a journal, but we're gonna talk about those differences. And then there's the poster, which you can also consider taking to a conference. And why are these uh, attendance uh, conferences and why publishing papers are important? What is their value? Well, there's a lot of them and I'm highlighting here the main ones. First, first of all, it's what makes your CV competitive in an academic or research world. And in that sense, papers are more valuable than going to conferences and within conference attendance, going with an oral communication is more important than going with a poster. And this is down to the, the capacity that you have to, to reach different audiences with the paper. Uh, your research goes wide global eventually, and that's in much more visibility and has been peer reviewed. And all of that gives credibility to the research gets published. So normally they are given extra credits in terms of CV evaluation. They also give you grant access and professional progression. The more you go to conferences, in, the better the chances also you have of getting collaborations and participating in projects. And as you accumulate papers and, and, and attendance in conferences and even acquiring funding uh, via grant access, all of those are metrics that are very widely used to evaluate your career progression. Of course, by sharing your results in a visible uh, way in the right channels, you're contributing to an improved society, to increase our overall knowledge uh, about how the systems work. And we are trying to make the message accessible to wider, the wider audience, the, the, the better. What it works in the main difference between papers and conferences is that Papers get published in, let's say, specialized and also on general journals. And they have different target audiences. But a conference normally is very focused on a specific topic. So the, the, 
the target audience of a conference is normally narrow, is composed of experts on the topic of that year's conference. While publishing in a journal, even if it's a specific one, it will have a much wider audience and, and that's what you might be targeting for. Other researchers, of course, become aware of who you are. You start building your, let's say, your professional niche um, within the ecosystem. And that's important because at some point of our career, we researchers have to become specialists in a particular field of research that is expected. And um, this is where you promote that visibility and you start building, uh, let's say, your market visibility and your market um, the specificity is by attending the conferences and presenting particular types of work. And of course, it's through either different types of publications or in different meetings, you're going to have to communicate your results to stakeholders and colleagues. So all of these um, tools are very important to build your career and also to make a difference in terms on who's on the receiver's end. In terms of the differences between these tools, I'm showing here, first of all, the differences between posters and presentations. So a poster, as you, as you know, I'm going to show you an example in a bit, um, they are just a printed um, research in a big, uh, big poster that gets um, accessible uh, in, within a conference. Normally, they are in a separate room and there are uh, designated times for poster sessions where it's expected that the, the researcher is next to its poster and able to discuss about it if someone engages with him or her. So they're very one-to-one -one communication uh, tools within a conference. Normally they're used for uh, more preliminary research or uh, when you don't have quantifiable results that you haven't been able to analyze fully, uh, when you cannot attend a conference, but someone else can take up your work. And if that's the case, I, I strongly encourage you to print in A4 um, sheets, uh, the poster so, and put it out there next to it as handouts so people can uh, communicate with you later if they wish. And eventually also, if you have a personal limitation in delivering an oral communication, uh, posters can work well for you as well in that way. In, in other words, is what I'm trying also to imply is that it's best to go to a conference with a poster than not to go at all. Okay, it's always another line in your CV and it is important to build that experience in that conference to then eventually upgrade to go with an oral communication. Sometimes what happens is that the, the conference organization also rejects our submission to participate with a communication, with an oral communication. They simply have to be selective. And if, if they offer us a chance, well, you cannot come with a presentation, but you can come with a poster. So in that regard, uh, it's a plan B, but it's still good enough for you because you have an opportunity to, to engage with people and to spread the word about your research. Presentations are an entirely different tool. As I said before, there are 10 to 15 minutes time slots where people are there presentially listening to you, giving a few slides um, discussion. And what we're trying to do here is to give immediate visibility to our research and to attract people to what we're doing, what we found. So normally we bring to the, these presentations innovative and proof results, validated proofs as much as possible, uh, based on quantifiable results and um, all of those issues of uh, statistical analysis, if possible, to have strong evidence backing up the arguments and the take home message we're going to be giving in this presentation. The, it, it, each presentation normally is dedicated to one paper or to one big project. And what we're trying to do is, in a, in a spoken way, to, to spin a tail, a tail incremental guidance to a key point. So it's kind of, a, it's really like a story, a short story. This is what we set ourselves to do and why we got this and these are the impacts. And normally the presentations are focused on the impacts. In terms of CV, it has a higher value than a poster. So if you can, go for that. I'm gonna show you very quickly how uh, they can look like for those who never done this before. So I'm sharing with you a poster, all right? So we're seeing it a little bit small because it, it, it should occupy, the size can vary, but this is a very traditional layout 
uh, and it's composed mainly or it's organized in the same way as a paper. There's even an abstract, much shorter. The, all of this layout that you see in, in, in any poster is free. Now it's up to us to decide how to organize the information. But traditionally, there's an abstract that tells people exactly what the entire poster is about. And then it's a mixture. I'm going to zoom out a little bit to, faci to facilitate the reading. What it corresponds to is a mixture of text and figures. Normally, in posters, figures dominate, and they should actually do so, because it's much easier to go through an image than to read very small print, even if it's on a wall in reasonably large print. So when we're building our posters, we have to try to highlight key information and to channel the reader through that key information so very quickly they can uptake the main message of our research because this is a room full of posters and people are perusing, they're going through all of them and yours has to catch attention of your target reader. So you have to work with the layout and the standing out of key information to attract that key reader. So perhaps or the, the key target audience. And in that sense, some images more, may be more easily recognizable than others to that um, particular person you might be targeting or that expert or people that are interested in a particular topic. And you might have to cut down some of the text in order to do so. And it's up to you to manage this. There's even some, some creative aspects in this slide and um, in this poster where this big figure on the right hand side actually goes throughout almost the, the entire length of the poster. Um, that's quite different and, and it's a way to maximize space, which is not only the main constraint in a poster, but it has normally the main aspects that you would have in a paper, albeit in this case it has different um, subheading titles. It doesn't have what we would call the traditional Imrad sections, but still it's very easy to, to pick up on where the key message, even because in this case they highlighted in bold. In terms of a presentation, that's an entirely different uh, concept, as you're seeing now here on this slide. What I'm showing you here is a is a presentation um, given in a, in a in a conference dedicated to transactive energy systems, and they're presenting um, ways to to improve system resilience. Now, the construction of these slides in any given presentation, it, it really is also free. Traditionally, people very often choose the IMRAD structure as well to, to set out these slides, but it doesn't have to be, as you're going to see in this one. So it has a very healthy, it has eight slides. I wouldn't go further than 10, 12 maximum, because remember, you only have normally 10 minutes to present and then five, four questions. So in that sense, eight, 10 slides are the ideal length. And the layout, as you can see, is as free as it works best for you in terms of leading the audience and engaging the audience in a storyline. When you're presenting orally in, in a potential way, what you're trying to do is captivate who's uh, sitting down listening. In that sense, images work much better and they're just there to uh, auxiliate you or to help you deliver the message that you have practiced in your mind. So don't aim for putting a lot of information into the slides. It's just enough information for people to understand the argumentation that we're giving and then use figures to showcase target um, specific key messages that are those that you want the reader to retain. It can really vary. This presentation has a mixture of a lot of images, some text and even tables. That can work, albeit tables are always more difficult to, to pass a message because it's difficult from a distance to read numbers. But it, it's very simple. The, they don't even um, spend a lot of effort on the slides in trying to uh, highlight specific information. And this is can be a clever way because by not having too much information on the slides, we are forcing the audience to pay attention to what we say. And that's where we can be much more engaging and uh, stronger in terms of passing um, the take home messages of our research and what is the output of what we're presenting here. So it can be up to you to be creative up to some extent in building these slides and then on the delivery mode so that 
you present a story with a full with, with the a full story with the beginning, a middle, and an end. And bear in mind that you always have to keep on engaging this the audience as you go through. So these are just two very short examples of what posters and presentations can look like. Other communication tools, even within the, um, the conference context, are, uh, for instance, the conference um, articles proceeding. And this happens when there is a journal normally associated with the conference, or is the conference itself uh, that publishes what they call proceedings. So it's it's similar up to some extent to a, an article published in a traditional journal, but there might be some differences and it's important to highlight them to you. So you first of all, you have to check if they're peer reviewed. So if these proceedings don't have a scientific community that was gonna be responsible for being re reviewers of the, the extended article or extended article, uh, abstract you're gonna be submitting, then this might backfire in terms of adding an important line in your CV because what happens very often is if um, if it's not peer review, you don't get, let's say, a validation that the science and the document itself are scientifically valid and sound. And what happens also if you, in another danger or danger not, or let's call it possibility you need to be aware of is that not all um, proceedings enable, or not all conferences enable you to publish there within the proceedings and somewhere else, and that's somewhere else corresponding to a journal. So what I'm saying, in other words, is that if you publish in the journal proceedings, you lose the chance to publish in a traditional or a journal of your field. You can only publish in one out of those two. If you choose for the proceedings, because the proceedings are dedicated to the topic of the conference, it's gonna reach the target audience you really want to, and the proceedings have a good, um, let's say, prestige perception in between your peers, that's fine. Uh, but what you have to be aware of is that if you publish in there, you cannot publish in, in a traditional journal, only in one of those versions. It's very commonly used to report work in progress as well. So if you're within a big project, this is another step that you can take to a conference um, a phase. Uh, that's that's very healthy to, to publish in, a, in the proceedings. Normally has is quicker to publish because it follows the conference deadlines and it's normally there's less peer review interactions. In the journal, you go through versions of the manuscript uh, until the editor and the reviewers are happy. And here now, normally one, two, eventually review um, iterations are enough and you get published if, if they accept it. The length is really tightly constricted here. So you might have to face some uh, difficulty in terms of putting the entire storyline within this length. Just out of comparison's sake, the journal article is, is an entirely different tool. Here, you're aiming not only for those people that were interested in the topic of the conference, but for all those interested in the context around the topic of your research. So there's a much wider dissemination. It becomes an official res register of scientific knowledge. It is always peer review. If you choose correctly the journals, they have to be indexed to be peer reviewed. And normally we aim to publish the, the most exciting research in journals, not necessarily on the proceedings. It depends on our, let's say, how um, fast we want to put the information out there. If there's a conference coming very quickly, we might choose to go for the proceedings so everybody can quickly get access to their knowledge. But if it's gonna be in the next year, you might want to consider the journal at the moment because it's gonna give immediate visibility as soon as it gets published. The journal uh, is a bit normally more demanding on the quality uh, of the research and it enables a much uh, lengthier document so you can build up more um, solid storylines if you wish. And they work very well when you have very innovative results or new methods or alternative methods to specific contexts. And as I said before, in terms of um, CV, they're, they're much more valuable. 
Technical reports, extended abstracts, and white papers are also some options in some fields you might wish to consider. So technical reports, as the name implies, it focuses on a specific te technique or technology. It can be not only they're readable by a non-expert, so they're not um, overly detailed. They work very well within the corporate context and they function a little bit like a register and normally is, is used to share information internally, but it is communicating science. So in that aspect, it, it is a plausible tool. Extended argument, uh, abstract, sorry, are um, options normally that you are given within the conference. They, they review results, but they're not fundamental arguments with a lot of detail. It's just an abstract with more information, and it's not really easy to give a full story there. So it sometimes is a mandatory um, tool or document that the conferences ask you for. That's fine. But then what is expected is that if you get accepted to submit with the conference proceedings, then you have to transform this extended abstract into a full paper. The white papers uh, normally focus on describing a theory behind a new technology product or, pol or policy by highlighting its advantages. And the idea here is that the information is shared very early, so it promotes troubleshooting of any hampering and any, any bottlenecks that might exist at the moment within the research of that theory or that technology or something similar to that. Normally it's very specific of some fields and it's not traditional, for instance, to find it in the life, science, life sciences. Has any of you been in a conference, like communicating with a poster or have you, have you um, uh, like been a viewer or participated not with a communication, but have you seen other people doing it within the conference? Yeah, I've watched on YouTube, uh, uh, like that are relevant to, you know, something I'm studying. I'll watch, uh, I'll watch the conference videos. What do you find of the different presentations? They're much easier to understand than the original papers. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the attempt. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. All right, so normally what happens is that when the videos you see in the conferences are already of published papers. So you can read the paper before you see the, the presentation in the conference because that's not always the case. Very often people first go to the conference and then the papers gets published afterwards. Like shouldn't the audience have a chance to prepare for to like make questions and so on? It's, it would seem that it would be- Oh no, no. Normally what the audience has access to is only the abstract uh, of that presentation. Um, and with that information, they decide, shall I go to this presentation? Yes or no. Uh, but in the vast majority of cases, people to participate in the conference only have to submit the abstract or an extended abstract. And then that's the information the viewer uses to decide, shall I go to this session, yes or no. Um, and then what is expected is that then that communication gets published somewhere near the future, either right? in the proceedings or in a journal. Uh, it, it happens reasonably frequently to publish first and then go to the conference. Um, but it, it's, I wouldn't say it's the norm. It might depend a little bit on the field, but don't, don't make that expectation or that uh, exception because it might not work. But I, I hear where, you, where you're coming from in the sense that it's, it's much easier to understand someone talking about its own work. Uh, in a 10 minute video than to go through the different lingua language vocabulary of 20 pages. And I don't know if you're aware of this, by the way, it might be interesting for you guys. Many journals nowadays are uh, offering the possibility of us, together with the submission of a traditional manuscript, to submit also a five minute PowerPoint or presentation of us discussing or presenting the paper. Uh, they, I'm not sure how they call technically between the different journals and then it varies a little bit. It's called normally always supplementary material. And what you have to do is you prepare five, a couple of slides or four or five slides, and you can record your own video or your own voice as you wish. And what the reader has access to if it gets published is to a short video of you introducing your work and why is it important and what you found. So it works a little bit like a mini presentation in a conference. It can be very useful to engage people, to even to bring them to your own website, which you can also promote. 
um, if you have one, or even to to add the uh, possibility of the of the viewer or the reader in this case to get more engaged in your work. So consider that option. It's it's like a training for a conference in in a very preliminary way. Have you been to presential conferences with poster sessions? Yeah, a couple. What did you find? Do you like posters? It's um, I think there's a lot of fun pros and cons of scientific communication. It seems I think posters are fun to socialize with around, and I love that you can point to things. I think that's super valuable, just the experience of pointing to things and then asking about things you point to. Very Everything's just you. kind of there in front of you. It's a fun social experience. Um, it sometimes can be misled. I feel like some sparse posters, people are encouraged to make like posters that are very legible. And that sometimes to me feels at the expense of like really seeing if the, the work has been good or has it been done or if there has been results that are can generalize. Um, it, you get a narrower compressed perspective, um, but it's made up for by getting to meet the person. I think that's really valuable. Yeah, okay. Good. It's good to. Uh, I'm, I'm happy you like them because they can really be very interesting tools to to for, for those that don't want to be on stage. First of all, which is could be a bit daunting, albeit nowadays everything is done remotely, but still. Um, but it, it works a lot to get very good collaborations because uh, when you do oral communication, normally it's in the in the coffee times or through social events that you have the opportunity to someone to come to you. And sometimes people are not easy to find. Uh, and posters are a way of getting to know the right people that might be handy in your future and to, to work in, in close collaborations because they will look out for you if they see the abstract and they see that there's a poster, they'll go straight to you. And that's almost having someone already uh, on our side and it can really be very interesting and to look for opportunities that way. Okay, in terms of types of articles and the rest of this video is gonna focus on articles uh, because that's the most uh, common and important and most visibility tool. Um, so your CV will have a mixture of, conf of conference proceedings, uh, articles, uh, posters eventually as well, uh, and eventually other options. And, but articles are definitely the strong points they should be aiming for to, to deliver science. That's the tool most expected to be used to communicate science. So far, we've been covering in the previous two videos, uh, the, the traditional full length original research article. This is the most common one. It corresponds to original and empirical research, so it has to be new data. Uh, normally, it focuses on, on uh, delivering the information in the IMRAD uh, structure. So we did introduction, meta results, and discussion, or something analogous. It is considered primary literature, and some of its key features as well, of course, are new pieces of evidence that have been validated somehow with analysis of uh, statistics or proofs. And those, those new information are contextualized as advances in the state of the art. That's what we're trying to do. So normally they ask a research question, they attempt to find an answer to it, they identify a research population or group, describe a method, and then test and measure something that corresponds to results that are interpreted in the current state of the art. They're the best ones to, to build career for sure. The most immediate, the second most common type of article um, that you might wish to consider are review articles. They're really very uh, good uh, to have in your CV because they demonstrate immediately they have a comprehensive and good knowledge of the existing literature on a particular topic. So one of their key characteristics is they're based on existing literature, so there's not necessarily a need to create new data. And what they try to do is to solve and identify gaps and problems and make recommendations to solve bottlenecks within a specific topic. So they correspond to critical and constructive analysis around that topic where people analyze what we know so far about that problem and how we, um, we authors can propose solutions and directions to be explored. There's three main uh, types of reviews, literature reviews, systematic reviews, and meta-analysis. And it's quite important for you to be able to distinguish between them. 
a literature review doesn't require um, collection, let's say, of data and specific research questions. In opposition, it's a much, uh, it's a, let's call it an umbrella paper that tries to give an updated summary of the current state of art around a specific question or a, a general topic. It depends how big the umbrella is. And very often, it's just a qualitative or very preliminary quantitative analysis of how many papers have been dedicated to this topic or to this specific question. And it tries to, to at the moment for this current uh, year, to make a standpoint, where are we on this topic? And what are we missing? How far ahead have we gone? What has been the historical progression in the research of this topic? What needs to be the next? Where are currently the bottlenecks? So it makes a standpoint on a specific topic. The systematic review is something entirely different. It uses pre-specified eligibility criteria to collect and then summarize existing evidence. And what we're trying to do with here is that we have a specific research question. And then with this eligibility criteria, we're going to select out of all the possible papers around this topic. With this criteria, let's say we just want publications uh, from the last 10 years or only corresponding to population groups older than 40 years old. Uh, and any criteria is it's eligible. Uh, you need to have a rationale. You, you're going to see some examples in a bit. And they, the, the, the authors have to have an approach to decide which information gets in and it gets analyzed and which one is left out because they want to have a, an answer to a very specific question. And that's the, the boundaries of that question are uh, those that determine where are the eligibility criteria. The meta-analysis is a statistical analysis and then a summary of results of multiple similar studies. So the meta-analysis always involves statistics and it goes and collects data from already published um, information and then reanalyzes from a different point of view trying to answer also a specific question. I'm going to show you very quickly also how they look like from a different context. In this case, now we are in the Journal of Nutrition Science. It doesn't really matter. It's just an example of a review article. So first of all, um, the review, sorry, I went a bit backwards. I'm showing you a traditional review. Uh, and a traditional review typically has this type of structure here on the left. It has an overview around the topic, in this case, it's flavonoids. It, then it decided to classify them, so it introduces the scope, which ones were brought in. And then current research and trends. This is what traditionally a review does, is where we are at the moment on this topic. And then it goes through any different subtopic they might wish to consider important. And normally reviews are there to try to push people in a, a direction on how to solve problems and move the state of the art forward. So functions and applications make a lot of sense because they are in the context of nutritional science. So they want to talk about how these uh, substances can, can be worked from this point on, not from an application point of view. Future research and development programs would also make sense in the review because it's a standpoint, then it's another block of information around working potential solutions, and then with those solutions, where can we go next? So this is a traditional review layout. A systematic review, this one um, is slightly different, is focused on the effects of almond consumption on fasting blood lipid levels. And it has an introduction uh, very early on, but then they go straight to the methods, okay? Remember that uh, I said in a systematic review, they had eligibility criteria. So normally they always have to talk about them. There's here a literature to search uh, in the methods to say, this is how we went to look for any publication existing on our topic. And out of those, these were our inclusion and exclusion criteria. This always shows up in a systematic review. Then data extraction and study quality to give, of course, validity that what was uh, incorporated as valid um, publications uh, are enough and uh, what are then the limits of interpretation based on what was decided to, to be included or excluded based on the criteria. And then, of course, description of the statistical analysis of um, that information. And then the rest are traditional, very often the uh, format of the IMRAT, the structure, results, discussion, and so forth. Finally, 
the this systematic review, by the way, um, it's uh, it, it's the systematic reviews normally are perceived to be very important in any given field because they, they normally try to push for solving a very specific problem because they're trying to answer a specific research question based on the existing evidence. So it, it showcases that you have a good understanding where we are at the moment. We need a systematic review to mathematically validate the cumulative evidence that we have so far. It's quite different from a traditional literature review, which is, uh, let's say, it's uh, your thoughts about the topic and your summarization of the current state of the art. There's no analytical process going on. Whilst in a systematic review and in a meta-analysis, yes, there is. Okay. So three different main times for you to retain. Very often what you, as you, the, what you have opportunity to do in, early in your career is during a PhD is to publish a literature review on the topic around the thesis. Uh, that's normally the first opportunity to have uh, to, to add this to your CV. Very often as well, they also operate through invitation by journal editors. All right. Systematic and meta normally are reviews that uh, are expected a bit later on in your career if you go for um, a more academic and research career. By the way, if you want to know a little bit more about how these three types are written, I encourage you to follow these uh, F1000 uh, research guidelines because uh, they're quite helpful in that sense. Other types of articles beyond the traditional and reviews are the proceedings, which we, we covered so far. Then there are things called a book review, and this corresponds to your own analysis of what a book uh, contributes to a field. So you can propose yourself to journals, and you have to find which journal accepts book reviews. Not all of them do. So if you wish to do something like this, you need to find uh, the journals that give you this option. And then I would encourage you to send an exploratory email asking the editor, would you be um, willing to accept a submission of a book review or, of that book? Would it be of interest to your journal? So don't do it before you get some feedback if the journal, uh, the target journal might be interested on that. So it's good to get experience before writing a full paper. And you can even uh, take the, this consideration that it's, it's a self-volunteering opportunity. And this can even uh, be a good training for you later on also to, to be a reviewer for that target journal. Commentaries, layers, or short reports and data notes are other options of articles. And again, all of these types really vary with the journal. Uh, each journal decides what they accept, and it's up to us to do that search of uh, if I want to do this, what journal does it accept, and which one might be more suitable, depending on the topic, of course, of the article. So commentaries and uh, letters or short reports are, as the name implies, brief comments on recent articles or feedback, including even react reactions. Uh, if you might uh, have preliminary research that uh, contradicts something that's been published and you want to put the heads up. Look, uh, that publication is important, but uh, according to my own research, there are some uh, limitations going on. So it reflects opinions on the topic and, and they're very useful for promoting discussing, this discussion around uh, normally what is a um, very controversial issue uh, in the field. So it, it's very quick to publish, very quick to get an answer. And in that way, it engages a, a, a not immediate conversation, but with some delay, of course, but it can um, also help you a lot to establish yourself as an expert on that topic. Data nodes normally are research data stored in a repository and they contribute to maximize data impact because it gets shared and you're given credit for the research and it promotes the, its reuse. And that can be extremely useful to speed up research in, in, a, lot of, in, a, in a lot of fields. So consider this option if you're willing to share the raw data or even some analyzed data, because um, it will be associated with you, even if it is re reused, because it can be linked to uh, a published article also later if you actually get to publish it. So you won't lose any rights. Other options, uh, it's quite a big list. Um, data sets, uh, the format is field specific. It 
as uh, the date is before, um, it promotes reuses, and it has a digital object identifier, which corresponds like the identity number, uh, um, specific identity number of any publication. So all publications have this DOI, digital object identifier, and it's a unique number that is associated with the publication. So these also give you the option um, of uh, having uh, re your data reused and it normally increases citations because people can reuse your data for a lot of different research questions. And because it has the DOI associated, it will count towards your article or not in this case, it's an article, it's a data set, um, but it will count for your citation scores. A register report doesn't is not available in many research fields, and uh, they correspond to two stage articles. In the first one, it's the protocol. First of all, is validated. So you submit first your methodology, your approach to collect data and analyze it, and that is peer reviewed. And if it gets va validated, then you are invited to submit a stage two article, which corresponds to the traditional original research paper. So the, the advantage of a register report is that it increases the publication's chances. In other words, the, the chances of being accepted. Uh, because what happens is that you have uh, your colleagues, peers, evaluating and uh, validating the methodology. And that gives you a green light to proceed, go to the lab, carry on, collect the data, and analyze it, no matter what the result. And because it has been, um, let's say, accepted as a novel, interesting and important research question tackled from the right angle with the right tools, then very often they're very willing to accept the publication, no matter what the impact of the results, because you can get, let's say, gray answers, white answers, and black answers. Um, so the, the impact can vary quite a lot, but normally these registered re reports, if they go through to stage two, they have better chances of being um, accepted, no matter what the impact. Software, as, as the name implies, describes software and scientific impact, normally is linked to a public code repository like SoftwareX or uh, GitHub. Um, and there's a, a specific advantage of SoftwareX because it gives peer review validation. And this is something you always want to strive for because it gives external validation of your research and of the document associated with it. So it's always something that you should highlight in your CV or when you're communicating your science or when you're choosing the type of article to publish, choose the options that always give you peer review, even if that implies delays because it has to go through the reviewing process, or even if that implies slightly less visibility because you're narrowing your let's say publication option to a specific channel and might not be as wide as you would wish. There's other, other types of articles called materials and methods and they're just, as the name is implying, they're there to register procedures and equipment. Normally they're storable in a platform called Methods X and it's mainly there to facilitate reuse and adaptation of existing experimental approaches. So, you're not sharing the data itself, you're sharing how you collect the data. So it might be useful for you as well to be the person that develops a new method that suddenly promotes a big advancement in the, in the field or in the research capacity in that field. It will be highly associated with you and that would definitely, um, you'll get credits every time somebody uses that new methodology. What I recommend is that, okay, you publish in this type of article, but then you associate let's say a case study where you applied that new methodology in a specific um, database or collection of data and validated or at least demonstrated its use capacities and advantages. So I would follow this article with a traditional full research paper. Clinical case studies or clinical trials are specific of uh, the life sciences in, in in, definitely in medicine, um, and for those that might be interested, um, they're, they're very different, uh, as the name implied. The case study is dedicated to a very specific um, uh, medical phenomena, typically, typically uh, one particular disease, and very focused very often on only one patient data. So it's, it describes the medical experience and normally it's always observational, this experience, because it's based on symptoms, 
symptom signs, diagnosis, treatments, and follow-up. So it normally they're dedicated to rare and different um, patients that are um, somehow special and uh, they want to put out their look, I had this patient with this characteristics and this is what happened medicine-wise. Much more important, those that us nowadays are very paying a lot of attention due to the coronavirus, we are much more interested in clinical trials where they uh, have specific uh, research questions and they uh, test those questions in large patient groups. So they get uh, validation, a very wide validation and normally these um, samples, these patient groups are really large and the larger the better because they go through formally and standardized experimental designs which are then statistically analyzed and the output is a traditional research um, article and it, it puts forward validation that yes, okay, this procedure um, works and or has this type of outcomes and this and normally the rule is the, the larger the sample the more robust is the study. In this specific case uh, authors have to publish first the protocols in a publicly uh, accessible registry because uh, they're operating or they're doing research with humans so of course some ethical issues arise and these protocols for study have to be validated first. But these are the, the main types of articles that you will find in the vast majority of journals. I don't know if any of you have come across something different so far, or, uh, and by the way, um, do you understand the, the differences and the options and the features between them? So normally, what is the type that you get in your research field? Yeah, usually just papers. Papers, okay, all right. Have you ever considered uh, these other options that, uh, because a lot of you might be working specifically within protocol labs, labs you might be working um, with a lot of producing solutions to, to solve bottlenecks and very often they're, they're very technical and so to, to make those solutions available in repositories or sharing data sets uh, might make a lot of sense if possible, of course. Uh, oh, yeah. Not only the, the publication itself, where you, you validated the proofs, you, you try to, to apply the theory into practice and see what happens, um, but it can be further opportunities to enrich, enrich in your CV if you consider some of these other options. Now, in terms of uh, decision tree, uh, I tried to help you a bit further. Which one should I go for? Because there's quite a lot of types. And even between the most common ones, which are original research and reviews, there are um, options. And because they're the most um, common ones, you, sh you should have this very clearly in your mind. So the, the main uh, situation or the main criteria is, do I have original research or is it based on existing evidence? Okay, so if it's based on existing evidence, already published work, you are in the realm of reviews and these are the main differences between them. So if it summarizes the state of the art on a particular topic, go for a literature review, a specific question with the eligibility criteria, systematic. If it's a conclusion you want to derive from statistical analysis on existed data sets that are made available, which is not often the case, then you'll go through a meta-analysis. They're, they're very valuable in terms of contributes to the field. They have high impact and high visibility. They're normally very cited. Or if you want to give insights and opinions on a recent book, then you have the, the book review. If you have the original research, then uh, there's two main uh, roads you can follow. If it's a full experiment with analysis of results, then you're considering mainly the type of article of conference proceeding or the journal. We've talked about the, these, uh, the main differences between them. I would just highlight also the fact that normally in the conferences, you have a fee associated with in, in, um, in a journal you do not, if you go through the traditional publishing format. And there's more room normally for um, longer doc documents and the peer review is guaranteed, guaranteed whilst in a conference, not necessarily, okay? If you don't have a full experiment, you have preliminary data um, and you want to put yourself out there as a voice in the field, then commentaries later and short reports are very useful to 
provide feedback on current uh, hot topics. Even if there has been a very uh, interesting paper coming out, you read it, you found connection dots between the, the outcomes of that research and the one you're doing, and you don't have time to explore uh, research and to set up a project and do research on that project and then publish the outcome of that project, what you can do is, is find those connecting dots or topics or contexts and put out there your opinion. Okay, this paper or this book, in this case paper just came out, uh, very interesting, etc. Uh, based on my experience, I can see interlinking points between this outcome and this type of research. And that can promote discussion, give you visibility, and even open research lines that might not be considered before that. So it will give you a lot of visibility, let's say, in the market. So that was it for how, what are the types of articles available out there and perhaps some of the most important uh, features and criteria you should be using to, to choose which one of them. The final part of this video is uh, addressing the types of publishing. And this is also very important because it has impacts on your career and it has impacts on the progression of science as well. So what you have to understand is that there are mainly three types of journals. The full open access uh, journals, the traditional journals are called subscription based, not only uh, an entity like a public university or an institution of some sorts that uh, subscribes a yearly subscription of access to this journal and gives it for free to its students or its, um, its co-workers. And then there are hybrid journals that have offer both uh, options. And these are the main differences between them. So in the traditional publishing format, which is one of the main ones, the initial one, you um, author do not pay to submit. It's the reader um, that um, get, has to pay to access it, but you author do not, okay? Whilst in the open accent format, the reader gets it for free and you author have to pay a fee, okay? And this is a normally, uh, a situation that hampers and limits the publication in open access um, because if you don't have funds to publish in open access then um, you have to go through the traditional format so it involves funding and there's much more detail around this and I just want you to understand uh, fully these three options so in open access the route is uh, the main one is what is called the golden route where you author have to pay an article process, processing charge fee that normally is covered by the project or by the fund. And then it's made if, if it gets accepted because it's still peer reviewed, then it has immediate access uh, from the reader's point of view through the publisher. The subscription based uh, route normally corresponds to an open access green route where the article after being accepted through peer review is archived, self-archived, by the way, in an institution repository or any uh, or any other uh, repository. And if you want to know what might be your options, if you don't have such an institution repository, you can search opendoor.org and uh, re3data.org. And eventually you will find where might be the best repositories for the type of research you have. And in this green route, normally there's an embargo period of around up to six months. So it's people, uh, readers don't get access it for free, at least in the first initial six months. So it can either be immediate if the embargo is short or it can be delayed depending on the publisher. In the hybrid uh, journal, um, there's an article processing uh, charge, okay? And normally requires funding coverage. And it would also correspond almost like a golden route because it gives immediate access through the publisher. So just retain most of, most of all that in traditional journals, um, in journals with, through the traditional publishing method, you author don't have to pay, the reader has to pay for access. In the open access is the other way around. You author, if the paper gets accepted, has to pay a fee and then the, the article is made available for free to the reader. 
Of course, this has consequences. In open access, the chances of you um, getting cited and visibility are much higher because everybody, as long as it has a computer, can, can go through it, can find it and read it. Whilst in publishing a traditional format, only those that have normally paid access actually go through these documents and there's a chance of them citing your work. So it's, it is a little bit uh, flexible and there are different consequences, benefits and disadvantages that we're going to be covering uh, in the next slide. If you don't have home institution repositories or if you have, uh, let's say, a more comprehensive topic, you might wish to consider it's another an open air repositories because they're very widely known and they're widespread. So it might maximize the chances of your paper being found if it's deposited there. So it, it is important for you to understand the differences um, and the, what are the consequences of either choosing open access or not. So normally the, the criteria is, do I have the funds available or not? And what, what happens in the vast majority of fields is that the order of magnitude of the fee is quite high. It can really vary between hundreds and thousands, no matter what the currency. And in that sense, you simply might not have project funds uh, making this option eligible. So you go through the traditional publishing route. But there are positive aspects you might wish to consider in open access if you have the funds available. For instance, the information is free and immediately accessible by all. And there's a, you transmit rights uh, to reuse, distribution, and reproduce if the source is cited. So it, it's very good, for instance, people working with intelligent um, artificial in, uh, intelligence algorithms and um, models and computer programs that go and mine the existing literature and they reuse and reanalyze the data because open access enables that, the traditional format does not. And because it's free, increased visibility and citation rates, it of course promotes data and knowledge mining, which in, uh, in a common process will promote also research efficiency. It very often, it also enhances interdisciplinarity and it, it normally promotes high innovation, uh, research politics, management and education because uh, it, it means that anyone, in no matter what their context, can read this information. So in that sense, it can really advance state of the art uh, through providing free access. Even You can even think uh, college to, uh, professors trying to find the latest research on something and because it's open access, they can find it, read it and, and go through it and use it in their own class, uh, classrooms. But because there isn't any perfect system uh, and open access was created as a possible solution to the traditional format that researchers in academia consider, well, this, is, this hampers research because if only those readers that have uh, funds can pay for, for the articles and then read them and find out if they're useful to them, that's not really uh, what is the spirit of research, which is collaborations and try to push knowledge further and forward. So open access arose from that context where people said, well, okay, if uh, the research is funded normally by public funds by the government, that information should be available for free for whoever might benefit from it. So open access was created under that, that spirit and it has all of these advantages because of its characteristics. However, um, it is still not a perfect solution for publishing. Um, we have some disadvantages that I'm highlighting on the right hand side. Uh, one of them is the highly priced free fees. So you either have funding backing you up on this option or it, it can become an impossibility. Then uh, the scientific community uh, still considers there might be an issue of lack of quality control. Why? Because, well, if the journals uh, in open access, if they accept journal, if they accept papers, they immediately make money because it's you author. When you submit, if it gets accepted, you pay the fee. So the more journals, the, the more papers they accept, the more articles they accept, let's say the higher the revenues. So um, the scientific community is a little bit um, still uncomfortable with the system in, in that regard. 
um, because some editors and some journals might have some more, uh, let's say, ambitious policies uh, to try to get higher revenues with a, a lower quality level of type and quality of research they accept to, to publish in their journal. Then there's issues also of authenticity um, because it's easier normally to publish with this uh, with this route, and um, there's there's some uh, challenging uh, in terms of uh, some researchers might take this chance to create uh, what we call um, phantom uh, or not authentic research. Uh, so the perceived quality by peers can be affected by these uh, two main issues. And normally what happens also is that open access journals uh, are newer. Uh, they're, they're like, you have to think of them like a business. So uh, open access journals are, are popping out almost every week and because they're, they're very useful, very practical and very successful um, businesses. And what happens is that the, the younger the journal, the lower the impact factor. And if you remember from uh, our first video, the impact factor is one of the main metrics that uh, gives the prestige um, value of any given um, journal. So the prestige of the journal corresponds to its impact factor. The higher the impact factor, the, let's say more influential the journal. So new journals normally are open access, but because they're new, they have a lower impact factor. So you might wish not to publish with the, those that are young, perhaps open access, yes, but in um, longer established journals. And what happens uh, nowadays or what has been the trend is that even if a journal is subscription based, it's, if it's traditional so far, the vast majority of them um, are upgrading themselves to give all the options to the authors. So you, don't, you can even aim for nature, science, or plus one, some of the top journals of, uh, across all fields, because they will give you uh, option open access, yes or not, or traditional. So don't let that uh, be a factor to go for lower impact factor journals if you feel that the quality and the impact of your research can actually go for a more prestigious journal. In terms of availability, not all fields uh, or disciplines have this option. Uh, so if there might be a limited availability, depends on what's currently your research topic, but the vast majority will, will give you such an option. So consider that. And then finally, most importantly, um, it, the open access journals, the pure ones tend to apply some predatory pressure. And by that, I mean that they will start um, contacting authors to submit uh, articles to their journals. And very often when you get such invitations, they are not credible. They are journals that are not peer reviewed, that don't have an editorial board that is sound or with known active players in the field. So if you get invitations of uh, a journal saying something like, we're journal X, uh, we reasonably knew in the field, we saw that you published this research there, we were very interested, we would like you to publish with us, submit something, uh, thank you very much. And of course, you would have to pay if it, if it gets accepted. So there, there tends to be some uh, unethical approach for some of the new open access journals because again, um, they're reasonably uh, successful businesses and some people are taking advantage of that situation. So these are some of the advantages and disadvantages of open access. And this is a decision I wouldn't uh, advocate you should be doing alone, particularly if you're a young uh, researcher, it's something you should be uh, deciding with your supervisor team, or at least with the co-authors of the article. Um, and you should be aware of uh, all of these issues before making that decision. But because I realized that uh, this is very impactful also for uh, researchers' careers, and even, of course, for the research itself, I'll leave you here some guidelines on how to manage this type of option. So in terms of career stage, if you're very early in your career, then I would advise you to publish quite a few articles in traditional subscription journals. And when you have two, three, five um, publications in this format, then you can start pushing for including some open access um, articles in your CV. 
Okay, so later on, mix a little bit uh, in that regard. With the, with the exception of the circumstance where you have the funds available and you will have highly impactful research or outputs. So when you have something very exciting to the field, it's gonna receive a lot of attention. And if you have the funds available, go for the top journal of uh, your field that has the open access um, option, because that will have much higher impact in terms of your career, your CV, and of course the research. But they normally reserve this decision uh, if you are leaving your career for, let's say, the exciting uh, research outputs, those that are really gonna make a difference and have ripples um, in the current state of art. But because this is a problem, verify the journal authenticity, and you can use these uh, three main databases to check if the journal is credible uh, to avoid that predatory unethical attitude. So directory of open access journals, POAM and um, CyRev. Uh, these are good databases to, to check. If they're there, if your journal, your target journal is there, it should be sound, should be okay. The journal age, as I've been saying, so new open access journals might be easier to publish with, okay? But older journals have higher impact. So uh, traditionally new open access journals are very eager to uh, increase their impact factor, that number that measures their prestige because they start from zero and the more they publish and the more their articles get cited, that number increases. So they're pushing for accepting a lot of research that hopefully would be receiving a lot of interest there for citations. Um, so normally it's easier to publish with these uh, new journals, but traditionally the uh, older journals have higher impact and in terms of CV, that um, might actually be more interesting to you. And also, of course, established journals are very widely recognized by your peers. So you have to realize that your target audience might not know about this new open access journal. So they might actually not find your paper because of that reason. Field citations, uh, it's quite important as well. Check if highly cited articles in your field are published in specific open access journals. So to narrow down your options, go through your field, find top um, articles in your, in your topic of research, the most uh, highly cited ones. And you can use, for instance, Web of Knowledge or Scopus, like I showed you in the, the previous video, the video uh, on uh, how to read a scientific article. And, and you can find the most cited ones and see in which open access journals they were published. So, then you'll get some reassurance. Okay, if I publish in this one, I know that the right people will uh, access my research and it will give it uh, the correct visibility that I wish. In terms of research impact, as I was saying, uh, just a little bit out of order, then the higher the research impact, the more the advantage is the open access publishing, of course, because due to its uh, visibility characteristic, um, but again, aim for, open access journals are already well established in the field. So that was it from my end uh, of today's session. Uh, quite a, a wide scope summary of where options of types of articles are there and types of publishing that are also um, currently uh, as options for you to publish and the different uh, pros and cons associated with it. Um, do, do you have any notion if the, the majority of the journals you, uh, the majority of articles you read are open access or not into journals of your field? Uh, they're all in archives. I guess they're open access. Right? They are in archives. Okay. Yeah. Are the, so, but they go through a peer review process, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. It's like published by universities or legit like researchers. Is that, I thought, like, I'm, I'm really not sure how, uh, you know, the archive.org works, but isn't it that, like, you publish on there and then, like, simultaneously it goes through peer review in a separate? The archive, if I could clarify, archive is a preprint server. Right. Okay. A family of preprint servers. So generally, people in fields like physics, um, CS, and now there's even a bioarchive and other fields like that, MedArchive, will post their paper to the to archive and then also simultaneously submit it to a peer review journal that allows the use of a preprint server. There are right. some journals that just allow this, this mechanism. Yeah. Okay. So don't believe everything that's in the archives because it has, might not have been peer reviewed. So in that sense, 
there might be some issues that were not flagged. That is important to be aware of. Were you aware of this uh, advantages and disadvantages of open access? Or is it entirely new to you? I, I'd say it's mostly new, yeah. Yeah, I really wasn't aware mm. of the different incentive structures. I knew that there was a big controversy about uh, Elsevier with um, that it was kind of almost like a, a rent control kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, I didn't know the full extent of the different business models. All right. Now you know. It's good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> good to know because it, it, it depends. Uh, like um, uh, all of you now at the moment are working with protocol labs. And uh, of course, it has its own um, publishing policy. But when you go through to different labs or different institutions, they'll have their own expectations and ways of working. So it, it's good to, to have a good grasp of what's going on in terms of options uh, for you and in terms of the institutional um, let's say choices as well so uh, it's, it might not be immediately applicable now but in the future it might make sense to know about these issues okay thank you very much